So in this video we're going to discuss computational thinking and the chapters from the book that we're going to use for this video is what is computational thinking, logic and algorithmic thinking, problem solving and decomposition, as well as abstraction and modeling. Um, I will save the modeling video for next week because modeling is such an in-depth topic that I wanted to spend a week on that uh, itself. So the first thing we want to discuss is what is computational thinking? Um, trying to define computational thinking can be tricky because we don't really have a solid definition, right? Like it says, you know, computational thinking has no direct definition. We kind of consider a series of similarities and relationships that cross and overlap. Um, kind of like what defining what a game is, right? You know, you have all different kinds of games. There are similarities uh, between those different kinds of things that kind of could sort of loosely define what a game could be considered. Uh, the computational thinking is very similar. Um, but kind of the, the strongest definition we could come up with is a focused approach to problem solving using the core concepts, uh, which we'll discuss those core concepts here in a second. Assuming computers will give you the solution to whatever problem you're trying to solve, right? So we're using these core concepts in conjunction with a computer uh, in the hopes that it will solve a problem that we are um, trying to figure out. So those core concepts that we use to solve problems, uh, we have logical thinking, algorithmic thinking, decomposition, generalization and pattern recognition, as well as three pretty important ones, abstraction, modeling, and evaluation. Um, and like I said, we'll save modeling for next week. So actually using computational thinking, um, really anyone can use computational thinking that wants to solve a problem with some kind of computer aid, right? And remember that really for something to be considered a computer, all it has to do is to be able to receive input, calculate something or do something with that input and give you output, right? So a simple example of that is a calculator, right? We could consider a calculator a computer um, it would take your numbers, whatever math operators you're using, um, perform the calculation, and give you the output, right? So you could use computational thinking by simply using a calculator. Um, it's not gated to a specific field of study like computer science. And using computational thinking, we can transfer some of those skills into just general problem solving um, as a whole. So let's break down some of these core concepts. Uh, the first ones being the logical and algorithmic thinking concepts. So logical thinking is using logic to determine correct or incorrect arguments by using some kind of assumption, right? So what we consider an argument is simply a chain of reasoning that ends in some kind of conclusion. And then an assumption in logical thinking uh, would be the premise of our um, of our argument, right? So our premise has some kind of truth value that we want to be determined. It's either going to be true or it's going to be false, right? The sky is blue um, might be my assumption or my premise, right? And that value will either be true or false. The sky is either blue or it is not. So you may have heard of deductive versus inductive reasoning. Um, deductive arguments is the strongest form of reasoning using premises which fall apart in two major ways, right? So one way that a deductive argument can fail is if one of your premises is false, right? So let's look here. We have three premises here. The first one being Charlie is a dog. Our second premise being all dogs are brown. And our conclusion would be therefore Charlie is brown, right? Um, we have some faulty logic here though, right? If we look at that second premise, we're using false logic by just stating all dogs are brown. That's some false logic, right? So this argument would fall apart because we have used false logic in one of our premises. The other way a deductive argument can fall apart is if the conclusion does not follow the premises at all, right? So our first premise here is all tennis balls are round. Our second premise is the earth is round. And our conclusion says the earth is a tennis ball, right? 
the logic behind our conclusion is faulty. Just because tennis balls are round and the earth is round does not mean that the earth is a tennis ball, right? So an inductive argument, as opposed to a deductive argument, right? Inductive arguments um, use probabilities instead of premises. So the logic has a high level of confidence for arguments to be correct. Um, therefore, our conclusions are not guaranteed, right? Inductive reasoning has a very high chance of being correct, but it is not 100%, right? So an example of this, a bag has 99 red balls and one black ball. 100 people pull a ball out of the bag. Williams is one of the 100. Therefore, Williams probably drew a red ball, right? So our probability is very high, right? 99 out of 100. It uses probabilities. 99% is a very high probability, but it is not a guarantee, right? Because there is a chance that the one black ball could have been pulled by Williams. So regardless of which argument type we use, deductive or inductive, the conclusion that we reach can only be as reliable as the logic that we use. Um, and if we want to kind of relate this into computational thinking, the conclusion is only as reliable as the programmer's logic, right? So let's talk about Boolean logic here, right? And this is one that we're going to be using quite a bit in computing and computational thinking. Um, Boolean logic is logic with statements that can have only one of two values. Um, and those values are true or false, right? So if you ever see Boolean, just know that you have some kind of statement, and that statement can have only one or two, one of two values. That can be true or it can be false, and that's it. Uh, sometimes these are shown as 1 and 0. So if a value is 1, that would mean it is true. If it's 0, that would mean it is false. The statements that we use in Boolean logic are also known as propositions. And some properties of propositions, a proposition can only have one value at a time. It must be clear and unambiguous in its meaning. So some examples here saying it is traveling fast is a very ambiguous proposition, right? What is fast? What do we consider fast? So we need to be very clear and unambiguous by saying it is traveling fast and then describe what fast is, right? Where fast is 60 miles per hour or greater. That's a very unambiguous proposition. We can combine multiple propositions to make a compound proposition. Compound propositions are connected by something called a logical operator. Okay, So logical operators, we have three main kinds here. So we have one that is called conjunction, and sometimes we refer to that as a logical AND, and the AND being all caps kind of lets you know that it's a logical AND. And a conjunction chains propositions where every, every proposition must be true for the overall conclusion to be true. So an example of a conjunction or a logical and says at least one square on the board is empty and neither player has a row, therefore the game is in progress, right? So if we're thinking about some kind of game here, these are our two conditions to let us know that the game is still in progress. Both of these must be true, right? Numbers 1 and 2 are my two propositions, and are joined together by a AND. So one square on the board is empty, and neither player has a row. Both of those being true gives us the conclusion that the game is in progress. So if we look over here at this truth table, um, and if you're in math for computer science, you'll be looking at a lot of truth tables. Um, but just so you can kind of see one here, logical and is this top row here, right? So P and Q are my two propositions. P results to true and Q results to true means that my conclusion will be true. 
right? That is the only way that my conclusion will ever be true in a logical AND. If one is true and one is false, my conclusion cannot be true. And if both are false, my conclusion cannot be true. So we just talked about conjunction, or the logical AND. So let's talk about disjunction, which we also refer to as the logical OR. Um, logical OR chains propositions where any of them can be true for the conclusion to be true. So this one doesn't care um, if they're both true or if only one is true. As long as there is at least one that is true, my conclusion can be true, right? So an example here, thinking back to our game, if either player gets a row or there are no board spaces left, then the game ends. So this would be if we want to have the game um, have multiple ways to end, right? So if we look at our truth table for disjunction, or the logical or, as we can see here, as long as one of these values is true, our result will be true, right? But if we look at our last row here, where P and Q are both false, we'll see that our conclusion is false. And our last one that we're going to look at is negation, or the logical not operator. Um, and not does not um, chain propositions together, like our conjunction chains two or more propositions together. Our disjunction chains two or more propositions together. Negation modifies a single proposition by flipping its truth value. Okay, so what does that mean? If a square is not occupied, then a player can place a token, right? So we could say, if the value of that square is not occupied, we could use the logical not here, um, then that means that it's free for a token to be placed. So the truth table for logical not says, if P is true, then the logical not results to false, right? If P is false, when I say, is it not P, right? Well, P is false, so that would result to true. And logical not can be kind of confusing. Um, when we get into some programming concepts, I think that'll help us understand logical not a little bit better. But to recap those three, conjunction or the logical and, this deals with multiple propositions. Every single proposition that uses the and operator has to be true. They all have to be true for my conclusion to be true. Disjunction or logical or also chains multiple propositions together, but here any of any one of those propositions can be true for my conclusion to be true. And like we said, not flips the truth value of a single proposition. And our last one that we're going to look at is impl implication, or logical implies. Um, this one is not something that we really use um, as much in computing, but it is important to know that it exists. Uh, this chains propositions together as well, um, where a correlation exists between the first and second proposition. So there's some kind of correlation between our two propositions, and that relationship is one way. Right, we can't work our implication backwards, it has to go one way. So for an example of that, if a player gets a row, then the game is over. Or if it is raining, the grass is wet. So if I say, if it is not raining, it does not mean the grass cannot be wet, right? You could have a sprinkler, um, Grass can be wet even if it's not raining, dew drops, all kinds of things, right? So we can see that these correlations can't be worked backwards. So for the implication truth table, we can see that if both are true, then we can know that P implies Q. If P is true and Q is false, P does not imply Q. If P is false and Q is true, P does imply true. And if both are false, P does imply Q as well.
by conditional or logical if and only if statements chain propositions together where the second proposition is directly influenced by the first. Uh, and this one can work backwards, right? So we can say if and only if all squares on our game board are occupied, then no more moves are possible, right? And here's the truth table for our if and only if. So moving into symbolic logic. Um, symbolic logic is just a fancy way of saying we're going to use some symbols um, in our propositions to reduce ambiguity, right? So rather than having a lot of text, we could assign, you know, if one square is empty to have the symbol P, and we could say neither player has a row is our Q symbol, and then we assign the game is in progress to the symbol S. So this whole statement here can be written as if P and Q, then S. And we know because we're using symbolic logic that P, we know that P is if one square is empty. We know that Q is and neither player has a row. And we know that S is the game is in progress. All right, so we're using symbols um, in place of these statements. So looking at more, some more symbolic logic, we also have given symbols to our logical operators, right, with the ones we just talked about. So our conjunction and all of those operators, or our logical and or not implies and if and only if, these are our operator names, but we do have some symbols that have been assigned to those operators as well. So this here would say A and B. This would say A or B. This one here would say not A. This would say A implies B. And this one says, if and only if A and B. And when we get into programming, different programming languages may have different symbols that correspond to these logical operators. Um, we will talk about those in a more specific programming sense um, in a couple weeks. So that was logical thinking. Let's talk about algorithmic thinking. An algorithm is just a fancy word that scares a lot of people, but all an algorithm really is is a collection of clearly defined and unambiguous steps, um, basically a set of instructions. Uh, algorithms or instructions are useful for explaining something to a third party. Uh, and we can really think about it as simple as something like a baking recipe, right? A baking recipe could be considered an algorithm, clearly defined and unambiguous steps. So some properties of an algorithm, uh, definiteness, each step is precisely defined so that a step can only have one meaning. And algorithms must also be sequential, so the steps must run in the order specified in the process. So you can't take a baking recipe, right, and take the very last step and do it first, right? Your recipe will not work if you do those things out of sequence. There are some ways to control algorithmic execution. Uh, we have a concept called iteration, otherwise known as looping. And what this lets us do is it lets us repeat steps without having to write them down over and over and over again. Um, like the song, 99 bottles of beer on the wall, right? Uh, if we use iteration or looping, we could write that song as X equals the number of bottles beginning at 99 sing and then we will list our lyrics here so we could say x bottles of beer on the wall so on and so forth um, subtract one from x 
repeat the verse if x is greater than zero, otherwise finish, right? So this list of instructions here, whoops. This list of instructions here is my algorithm, right? And we must do this thing sequentially, right? So here's the first one, here's the second one, so on and so forth. Um, but we can say, okay, well, x, the first step, we're going to assign a value using that symbolic thinking, right? Um, beginning at 99 and then saying the following. Then when we reach down here at the bottom, we would subtract one from x and then repeat this step. So we would go back up here as long as x is greater than zero. If x is not greater than zero, we'll just finish the song, right? Uh, variables control the execution and specify when to end the loop. So when we talk about variables here, one of our algorithmic variables is the value of x, right? x is the number of bottles beginning at 99. x really determines how many times we're going to do this um, algorithm. How do we know how many times we're going to do it? If x is greater than 0, keep repeating, otherwise finish, right? So a variable controls the execution and specifies when to end the loop. We also have a concept called selection. Um, or conditional. This is a way to test a variable's current value and decide what to do based on that value. Um, so if we look back here, if x is greater than zero is a conditional statement, right? If it's greater than zero, do this thing. That's my condition. Otherwise, finish. We can use conditional logic at any point in the algorithm. We also have a concept called algorithmic states, um, and states are what makes sequence important in algorithms. So a state is simply the environment that the algorithm is being run. Uh, once the computer runs something, it forgets the data. So sometimes we need to tell the computer to remember a value by using some kind of variable, right? And we have a concept called variable assignment, uh, and that means that we are writing a variable um, to update through the algorithm. And I'm going to go back to our algorithm here just to have another example of that. We already said that x is our variable, right? And we know that x represents how many bottles of beer are being sung about. Um, and we also know that x has a starting value of 99, right? I do update the value of x in my algorithm down here at the bottom, right? Subtract one from x. So the very first time we go through these instructions, x starts at 99, the lyrics are sung, then we'll subtract one from x, making x now have a value of 98. Moving back up here, x now has a value of 98, right? So 98 bottles of beer so on and so forth, subtract one from x, now it's 97. All right, so that is the concept that we're talking about when we say uh, I'm assigning values to this variable and I'm updating that variable throughout my algorithm. So some common mistakes or gotchas that can happen when you're working on algorithms, it, clarity, precision, and meticulousness is very important in algorithms. Um, a computer will do exactly what it's told, even if it's impossible, right? And when we start programming, we'll probably have some times where our programs will crash or something won't work. Um, the computer is simply doing exactly what it's told, even if that won't work. Because um, something important to remember is computers have no inherent intelligence. intelligence. Um, a computer won't do anything that it hasn't been told to do. Computers don't have common sense, right? They don't have brains. They don't have common sense. The computer won't interpret what, you, what it thinks you mean. 
I won't make assumptions or fill in any blanks. Um, basically, you can think about computers as being very stupid. They only do what you tell them to do. Um, and it's very true that a computer cannot make a mistake, right? Uh, where mistakes come in in applications and software and stuff is from the programmers. The computer is just doing what the programmers have said to do. And if there's a bug in a game or uh, some kind of runtime error on an application, that is the programmer's fault, right? So that's why it's really important. We need to be very clear, precise, and meticulous in our algorithms to make sure that the computer executes it properly. Another thing, right? Human language leads to some gotchas. So English, we have, I'm, I'm an English speaker, right? So there are some things in English that could lead to some gotchas. An example, everyone whose surname begins with A and B, please stand up. So this logic works for us as English speakers, right? If your name begins with A and B, stand up. What a computer would do, though, with these instructions is try to find someone whose name begins with literally both the letters A and B, right? It's going to take that instruction very literally and not interpret what it thinks you means because it can't do that. So if we want to avoid this, we want to use the correct logical operators here. So the correct logical operator for this statement may be something like, if your surname begins with A, or your surname begins with B, please stand. That might be a better um, set of instructions to give the computer than if your surname begins with A and B, please stand, right? Uh, logic and algorithms treat if-thens a little bit differently. So in logic, X and Y truth values are related. Whereas in an algorithm, the execution of y is dependent on x. So we're not really talking about truth values as much in an algorithm as much as execution of steps or execution of commands or something like that. Uh, we have something called the order of precedence. This is similar to your order of operations in algebra. Um, our order of precedence with our logical operators the very first thing that the logical, the very first logical operator that will be executed in an algorithmic expression is the parentheses. So anything inside parentheses will be done first. Um, after that, we will look at for our not operator. So any negations that we're going to do will happen here. The third thing that will happen is greater than and less than logic. And the last things that will happen is logical and and then logical or. So that's the order of precedence for um, an algorithmic expression. So moving into our next topic, uh, problem solving and decomposition. Uh, this is a systematic approach to problem solving, meaning there we have a system in place, there are some steps we're gonna execute um, in order to do this. So the very first step here is we want to understand the problem. And then after we understand the problem, we can devise a proper plan. Then we can execute the plan. And the very last step of problem solving is reviewing, extending, and improving the solution. So when we have a problem, we don't want to panic. That's our first step. Um, remember that the size and complexity of any problem can be broken down into smaller steps that are interrelated. Um, it can be very tempting, um, even with, and I'm going to tie this into programming, right? You get some kind of programming problem, it can be very tempting to just write the solution from the very beginning, try to solve it immediately. Um, try to resist the urge, right? Because if you remember, any problem can be broken down into smaller steps. So doing that is very helpful when you're trying to um, properly solve it. So going back to our, our system, right, the very first thing we talked about was understanding what the problem is. Um, so the very first thing we want to do is define it. You know, what is the problem that I'm trying to solve here? 
and basically any problem, we want to move from an unwanted state, that's our starting point, to some desired state, which is our goal, right? That's kind of the basic steps of any problem that you solve, is moving from an unwanted state to a desired state. So when we talk about really understanding the problem, there are some things that can be um, need to be done, right? So the first thing is write the problem in your own words. Ensure that there are enough knowns for a solution to be made, right? Some problems you may not be able to solve because you don't have enough information. Uh, the goal defines what needs to be done, but not how. Um, and we want to give the goal a tangible value, right? So let's say my goal is to move from an unwanted state of having all of my grades for my first semester at ETSU, right? And my desired state is to be able to calculate my current GPA, right? I want to take those just list of grades and I want the goal to be a grade point average, right? I want that to be my GPA. So we've wrote the problem down. The first thing we want to do after that is make sure there are enough knowns for a solution to be made, right? So to calculate a GPA, you need the number of credit hours of the class, and you need what grade you earned in the class. Really, those two things are all you need for each of your classes to calculate your GPA. So let's say that I don't know the total credit hours, right? I do not have enough knowns for a solution. So I would need to either obtain those credit hours somehow, or maybe shift my goal a little bit. Bringing back to this goal defines what needs to be done, not how point. I know my goal is to have my GPA, but that doesn't really define how I take credit hours and letter grades and turn that into a GPA, right? That doesn't really say how um, I do that. So when we're making a goal, there are three things we want to consider. Um, quality, um, and this is something that, that you'll learn more and more about as you progress through computer science or whatever you're learning about. There are multiple solutions to any given problem. Some of them are better than others. So think about, you know, what is the best solution to the problem? Collaboration. Talking the problem out to yourself or someone else can help. And then iteration. After making a solution, go back to that solution and try to improve it. And going into specifically, you know, computing and programming, you may say, and really you're kind of free to determine what makes a better solution or not. Um, but just as an example, right, let's say you have a program that is 200 lines of code, right? And you decide to yourself, this could be a better solution if I could have less lines of code. So after you have the solution, go back and try to improve it, right? See if you can shorten it, so on and so forth. Moving into decomposition, um, decomposition is just a long word that means I'm taking a complex problem and I'm breaking it down into smaller, easier to deal with problems. And the goal with decomposition is to have little sub problems which can be solved individually through recursion. Um, and recursion just means I'm breaking those little problems into simpler ones while, keep, while keeping the original form. And this can be represented visually. Here's an example from the book. Uh, let's say that my problem, right, my main problem is a science project, right? That's a pretty complex problem. There's a lot that goes into a science project. So we can use decomposition to break that main problem down into some smaller problems, right? So we can see science project has been broken down into four smaller problems. The first problem being background research. And background research could be broken down into even 
smaller problems, right? Experimentation, write the dissertation, and then submit the dissertation. So those are my four smaller problems that have been broken out of this science project. Like I said, our subcategories or our subproblems can break down further as much as needed. Um, you know, you may decide that you've reached the smallest that you want to go um, or not. So you can keep breaking down those subcategories as far as needed. A decomposition can give a strong starting point uh, to plan and to focus on what to do and what not to do. Um, It shows our tasks and their relationships, but not necessarily the order in which the tasks should be done. So this example here, they're numbered, so this kind of could be the order here. But really, these don't have to be in any kind of order. Um, it's kind of up to you to determine which one you want to order. First, second, third, whatever. Some other problem-solving strategies. Uh, think critically. So why think critically, right? Uh, question ideas and see how they handle scrutiny and always ask what could go wrong. So thinking critically can kind of eliminate um, bad solutions. Some people think that always asking what could go wrong uh, is a little pessimistic, but if you can kind of eliminate as many um, potential pitfalls before you get started on solving a problem, that just makes solving it that much easier, right? Uh, solve a concrete instance of a problem. Uh, deal with problems in concrete terms instead of abstract. So an example of that is like drawing a complex shape, right? Uh, break that complex shape down into some basic shapes and then combine those together. Find a related problem. Um, if you find another problem that's similar to the one uh, you're trying to solve, that can help give you direction to find your solution. Uh, and this can give you insight, if, if not the direct solution itself, it can definitely give you insight. Uh, another strategy is working backwards. Uh, this is very effective with well-defined goals, um, like finding a departure time when you want to be somewhere at a specific time, right? If I know that I want to be at my office at ETSU at 3 o'clock, I could work backwards to determine when I need to leave um, my home, right? Moving into patterns and generalizations. Um, this is taking similar concepts and generalizing them into a single concept. Uh, and this can make problems simpler by limiting the number of concepts that we are thinking about. And it makes problems more powerful because they can be used in more situations. So some things we can use to recognize simple patterns are repeated nouns, repeated verbs, uh, repeated descriptions. So adjectives or properties like red, long, or smooth. Um, and looking for actual numbers, which can be replaced by variables. A more complex pattern is something like a loop, which we talked about when we talked about algorithms. Um, a loop is just a pattern among a sequence of instructions. And remember that loop execution is controlled by those variables, right? Back to the beer example that we did, we said x had a value and we're going to keep looping until x's value is something specific, right? So that loop execution is controlled in the beer bottle song, for example, by that variable x. Uh, subroutines are simply patterns among separate groups of instructions. And I've got some examples on these um, here in a second. And a rule is just a pattern among conditionals or equations. So let's look at this example here. Um, let's say that we want to draw the two eyes on this smiley face, right? Um, to do that, we might have a simple algorithm, four steps here. Draw a circle with a radius of 6 at position 40, 40. Then I want to draw a circle with a radius of 3 at position 40, 40, and fill it in black, right? So that would be this first eye here. Then I'll do the same thing at position 60, 40, 
with the larger circle and the smaller circle. All right, so we can see each one of my algorithm steps corresponds to one of these shapes here, right? So that one corresponds to that. This step corresponds to the smaller circle. This step corresponds to the other eye and this step corresponds to the other small circle, right? So let's think about some patterns that we could use here um, to make this algorithm more simple. So looking at loops, we could use a loop here um, to make that algorithm a little more simple. Uh, we need to define some variables here. So coordinate, um, is going to be 4040, that was our first coordinate, and 6040 was our second coordinate, right? So these are our variables that are going to control the loop. So I can say for each one of my loop coordinates, do the following things, right? Draw a circle with radius 6, so the big I, and then draw a circle with radius 3, which is the iris, right? and fill it in black. And I'm going to do that how many times? Well, I'm doing it for each of my coordinates. I have two coordinates, so my loop will execute two times, right? The first time it will do the left eye on the smiley face. You can see my amazing art skills. And the second time it will do the right eye on the smiley face. And we'll pretend that these are circles and not whatever whatever that is. So that's an example of using a loop rather than just a basic set of steps. A subroutine, which we said a subroutine was a pattern among separate groups of instructions, right? We see that loop still has four steps, just like our initial algorithm here. But we can see subroutine um, only has three steps, right? So we're actually shortening our steps here by using these patterns. So I'm gonna have a subroutine, and remember a subroutine is just a subset of instructions, called draw i. And it's a subroutine that has four um, parameters that we're going to use. It, it needs four things to work. It needs a first radius, a second radius, an x-coordinate, and a y-coordinate. Alright, so I can draw a circle with radius r1 at position x, y, and I can draw a circle with radius r2 at position x, y filled black. All right, so for our, our left eye, right, I could draw a circle with radius 6 at position x, y. So let's just say that's 1, 1, for example. Then I can draw a circle with radius r2 at position x, y, filled black. So here's my second circle. Let's say that that radius was 4, and that's at 1, 1 as well. So you'll notice that when we use variables here, this gives us some flexibility, right? I don't have a hard-coded radius of 6 and 3, and I don't have hard-coded coordinates anymore. What that means is now we can draw the face at any coordinate and any size that we want, right? So I could do the right eye as a circle with a radius of 15 at coordinates 7 and 15, right, if I wanted to. And I could do the inner circle with a radius of 8 at coordinates, I don't know, 5, 13. Right, so we're using subroutines here, uh, a set of instructions and variables. And that gives us flexibility rather than locking us into what we had with our algorithm, which is a radius of 3 and 6 at a very specific set of coordinates. And a rule, we're going to assume for our rule that the inner radius has to be half of the outer radius. Um, 
and the rule can be written basically just like our subroutine. But we'll see that we've actually removed some stuff from the subroutine. Before we had R1 and R2 and then X and Y. But now because we've added a rule in which says the inner radius has to be half of the outer radius, we don't have to worry about R2 anymore, right? All we really need is just the total radius. So I have a subroutine that expects a radius and a position, right? So draw the circle with whatever radius I assign to R. So let's just say R equals 10. So I want to draw a circle with a radius of 10 at position, let's just say 1, 1 here. So we'll say this is a circle with, oh, that one's rough. This is a circle with a radius of 10 at position 1, 1. Remember our rule says the inner radius has to be half of the outer radius. So my next step says draw a circle uh, with a radius of 1 half r. So 1 half r would be 1 half of 10 in this case, right? So 5. So draw a circle with a radius of 5 at position 1, 1, filled black. All right, so we can see that using the rule eliminated a variable. So before we had four variables, now we only have three. Sometimes, you know, using these subroutines and stuff may be necessary, other times it may not. And that's kind of up to you as the um, programmer. So abstraction and modeling. I'm gonna discuss abstraction uh, in this video, but like I said earlier, I'm going to save modeling for next week. So abstraction and modeling both discuss um, expressing an idea with specific context while suppressing irrelevant um, information. We use abstraction all the time, uh, even if you don't really realize it. Uh, this map over here is a good example. This is an underground metro map. Um, we can see that this is abstracted a lot, right? A lot of information that's irrelevant has been suppressed from this, from this map, right? All we really see is some lines, some names, and we have different, you know, shades of lines. We don't know, you know, we don't know the boarding times for each of these things. For example, we don't know the streets that are above the metro. We don't know a lot of things, right, are being suppressed here because it's abstracted to be a useful um, map. So let's compare the idea of a metro map, like the one we just looked at, with a terrain map, right? Think about the maps that show topography. Um, those are very different maps, right? Uh, the metro map is made to limit information, and the reason for that is so that commuters can understand that map easier. If you handed a user a terrain map of the metro system, right, that would be very confusing to read um, and use. So we've abstracted a lot of that unnecessary information for ease of use. So some things that are kept though, right, because abstraction doesn't mean you just remove everything, but a terrain map, you could keep the ordering of the stations, you could keep the specific metro lines, and the interchange locations. So those are the three things you've decided to keep and everything else has been removed, right? So like this. Uh, context is very important when we're abstracting. Um, abstraction operates on levels that provide certain levels of detail and context. Uh, so we have something called high-level abstraction and low-level abstraction, and that's kind of a spectrum, right? It's not really, it's not really two things. This is high-level abstraction, this is low-level. It's kind of a spectrum. Uh, as we move down, that kind of reveals more to us, and moving up obscures more from us, right? So let's look at this, this uh, diagram over here. Let's discuss email, right? Um, 
So the high level abstraction of an email application, all the things that goes into an email application, all the information about how it works, what it's doing, all that stuff, the highest level that we have, right, would be like an email web app. We log into Outlook to our ETSU emails and we can see our messages, right? That's very high level abstraction. As we move down to our lower levels of abstraction though, we could say, okay, well, an email application makes the contents of computer memory readable to humans, right? And if we look at what computer memory would look like, that's just binary values, right? Zeros and ones. So that's not really necessary for us as email users to know what the binary contents of our email inbox is, right? And to move even lower from that, that binary memory values are stored as digital information signals from the network. So, and this is what network signals look like on a network map. This means nothing to us as email users, right? If you handed just an average email user um, a network map, they'd be like, what is this, right? So we've abstracted from this very, very low level of abstraction all the way up to a very high level of abstraction, which is converting that binary converting the, the network map into binary memory values, converting that into readable text, and then I would argue that we could go one higher and talk about user interface, making the user interface usable, hiding certain things on the user interface, and stuff like that. All right, so abstraction, the takeaway there is it's a spectrum here. Context is key, right? Um, depending on you know, what you're abstracting, you may need to go higher or lower as needed. The important one to remember, right, is that moving down in your abstraction levels, so a low level abstraction is a lot of information is revealed to you, and the higher level of abstraction you go, the less information is revealed to you. So here's another example of abstraction. Let's say we have a rental company that needs to manage uh, inventory. And let's just say they offer just kind of an any car will do category of rental. You could say all cars that they have could be grouped under the same abstraction, right? Let's say they move down a little level here of abstraction and say, well, let's separate our inventory by transmission. Now you have two abstractions, right? You have manual and automatic. Uh, they could separate vans by loading size, making even more abstractions. So let's say your van has a large loading size and a small van has a small loading size. That's two more abstractions, right? And as you'll notice, each one of these is getting more and more detailed. As we're moving down our abstraction levels, more information is being revealed um, about what we're abstracting. All right, so very high level, we don't care any vehicle can be rented. That's just one abstraction, right? A little bit more information is, okay, well, let's separate it by transmission type. Then, we, then we're getting into loading size. You could separate by brand. You could separate by vehicle type. So like, you know, van, SUV, sports car, truck, you know, all kinds of abstractions. The lower you get, the more detailed you get. So here's kind of a, a diagram of that. Each layer of, a, of an abstraction is built recursively from the level below. So for example, all car brands become cars. All cars join motorcycles and vans to become vehicles. All vehicles join spare, tarts, spare parts and tools to become inventory. So we can see our very low level of abstraction here is let's say a coupe, right? So some examples, we got like saloon, sedan, limousine, stuff like that. If we move up a level, we just have the category car, right? And maybe we're gonna say, okay, well, I'm gonna combine van and motorcycle with a car. 
Moving up, that would give me vehicle, right? If I've combined all these different types of vehicles together, that would be a higher level of abstraction. If I just combine vehicles with spare parts, tools, all that stuff, that's just inventory, right? So we are moving from the most detailed level to the highest detailed level. Uh, the previous abstractions have been used to get from detailed to general. So the ones I showed before have been more detailed to less detailed. Uh, they can go the other way around. So let's think about like Netflix or YouTube. They begin right with just your generic viewer application. And then they've built an abstraction to promote other videos, right? They promote by genre. If you think about Netflix, uh, they could go a further level down and factor in geographical location uh, to promote language specific videos. Um, you know, YouTube, your, your recommended videos, there's some abstractions that have occurred there um, that they have implemented to get those to show up. So YouTube at its most abstract is just a video viewer, right? But there's all kinds of abstractions that go in to make that more complicated. Uh, abstractions can distract from reality. So I'm going to go back to that, um, that metro map, right? If you were lost and you, all you had was that metro map, that might not be good, right? Because that has been abstracted so much to avoid, suppress, and kind of hide details from you just for ease of use. Um, so just depending on the use of your abstraction, it can be detrimental um, if you go too far up or down in the abstraction levels. Uh, abstracting recklessly can get you lost in the abstraction. Uh, for example, the philosopher's argument that attempts to answer everything but actually ends up explaining nothing, right? What abstractions are great for, though, is organizing solutions, managing complexity, and reasoning behavior in general terms. Um, but to us, right, as programmers, there needs to be something concrete, a reason to do abstraction, and it must be instigated. So an example of that is uh, think about like Amazon, the website Amazon, right? End users, you and me, that go to buy things on Amazon, we don't have access to other Amazon users' uh, accounts, their banking information. We don't have access to Amazon's inventory. Uh, we don't have access to a lot of things that Amazon's website probably hides from us, right? Because it, those developers that have created Amazon's website have used a concrete abstraction. They've said end users do not need access to X, Y, and Z, and they have implemented or instigated uh, that abstraction by hiding it from us, right? We don't need to see it, so we don't see it. There are risks to using abstractions. Uh, unknowingly ignoring a detail that affects the behavior of an abstraction will result in something called a leak. Uh, if that happens, you don't have to recreate your abstraction from scratch. Um, you can just amend the abstraction model to factor that leak in. So an example, that would be like operating a car, right? There's probably something you're going to forget about operating a car uh, if you were writing that out as an abstraction. Don't recreate the abstraction from scratch. Just amend it, fix it, right? So that does it for this video. Um, next week, I will post a video on modeling. Um, both in a computational thinking sense as well as a programming sense. I'm going to bring a little bit of how to model um, what you're going to be coding before you actually start writing code. Um, because if you can have a solid model uh, for what you're going to be programming, it can really save you a lot of time when you actually sit down to write the code itself.